Amen. You may be seated. Well, again, another exciting passage as we look into the book of Acts tonight. We're in Acts chapter 18. We'll be looking, the Lord willing, at verses 8 through 11. If you want to follow along, it's Acts chapter 18, verses 8 through 11. And I have an apology to make. The bulletin this morning gave the title of the evening message as Making the Jews Jealous. That's actually the sermon for next Sunday evening. The text is correct. The title was wrong. The title for tonight is Where to Look for Converts or The Bottom of the Barrel. That text was correct, Acts 18, verses 8 through 11, but the title was wrong. And that was my mistake when I typed out the next six months of sermon titles to give to Joanne for the bulletins. So the title of the sermon for tonight, I had accidentally got it off on the wrong line. So uh, tonight it's Where to Look for Converts or The Bottom of the Barrel, Acts chapter 18, verses 8 through 11. Let's join in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the fact that you saved us. We were nothing. We were worthless. And yet you loved us with a love which is unfathomable. You reached down to the bottom of the barrel to get us. And you chose us and saved us and transformed us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, we pray for your blessings on your word as it goes forth tonight, that it would not return void, but that it would accomplish that which you please, and that it would prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you recall that last time we were looking at what was called, or what I called, the tipping point. That was verses 5, 6, and 7. And to give us sort of a running start into what we're looking at tonight, I'm going to read those three verses. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, so they're starting up in the north, they're coming south at this point, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment, and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads, I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house was joined hard to the synagogue. And that's going to be very important for our text tonight as we look into it and see the people that got converted as a result of Paul's ministry there. Now, last week we talked about sometimes we need motivation of others to get us moving with our central mission of proclaiming Christ to difficult audiences. And we saw that Paul had been not actually pushing it too hard until Timothy and Silas showed up. And, of course, we had discussed and discussed in detail in time past about in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word would be established. So now that they have shown up, he moves from his temperate reasoning, which he's been doing in the previous passage where he had been basing it upon scripture and we see him doing that kind of presentation in all the synagogues and acts but when Silas and Timothy arrived he started to become very blunt but they hardened their hearts just like Pharaoh did just like many people do today just like sometimes Christians in the church do they hardened their heart and when there's a hardness of heart at the continual well-reasoned presentation of Christ it's time to be blunt, and if the rejection continues, as he did here, he moved on and he moved down to uh, right next door. <laughs> uh, didn't move too far away, but he did move. And he quit presenting it in the synagogue as he had done before. We saw several other very interesting things here. We saw that he had been doing what is called being long-suffering. There were five steps in the progression that set out in the passage before moving on. There was first the respectful, tempered, well-reasoned argument, which was ignored by the audience. Second, there were multiple witnesses to the truth, and there was a rejection of the multiple witnesses. Then there was a forceful drawing of the line in the sand, and that resulted in blasphemous rejection. Then he moved on. The end of the opportunity was there. But right at the very end, as we'll see in our first verse tonight, some key people believed, including the ruler of the synagogue. And then when the Jews continued to reject Paul's presentation, which was now a forceful rejection with blasphemy, he shook off the dust from his sandals and moved on. It was a tipping point. It was a gigantic tipping point. It was a tipping point not only for that one particular synagogue, but it was a tipping point in the entire presentation of the gospel. A tipping point in the book of Acts where now he's going to be going to the Gentiles. That was his principal call in the first place when God had laid his hand on 
Paul, and Paul is going to explain that in his epistles, that God called Peter to be the apostle to the Jews, but God called Paul to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And so now we find a very important tipping point, and we pointed out that those tipping points can come in the life of an individual whom God has called and encouraged, and then more strongly encouraged, and finally sort of put some pressure on, and if they continue to reject, there's a tipping point in their life and God quits using them. There can come a tipping point in the life of families. There can come a tipping point in the life of a church. There can come a tipping point in the life of a nation. All around us, we see tipping points going on. We see things collapsing and falling down and ruin and despair and utter destruction. And it's happening in churches all across the United States. I hope it hasn't happened here. I hope we're not in free fall at this point. But you know, there can come a tipping point and there can even be revival after the tipping point. But it still will continue to fall. That's what happened in the days of Josiah. The nation came to repentance, but because of the sins of Manassas, they had already fallen into free fall. There was no stopping. They had to come under judgment. Tipping points. That's what we talked about last week. And then we talked about the same five steps in the character quality of God for long suffering. And we talked about the difference between patience and long suffering. Patience is learning how to deal with difficult circumstances in life. Long suffering is learning how to deal with difficult people in life. And we covered a number of different passages. There are only 17 places in the scripture where long suffering is mentioned. And yet it is a very key and important character quality of God. That's the first thing we saw. It's one of his core character qualities in Exodus 34. We saw God's long suffering is connected to God's mercy and forgiveness. We saw that God's long suffering is an extension of God's grace, mercy, and truth. We saw that God's people can appeal to his long suffering in times of distress. We saw that God's long suffering is designed to lead us to repentance. We saw that God's long suffering stops the mouth of those who claim that God has not treated them fairly. We saw that the believer is to reflect the long-suffering of God in dealing with others. We saw that long-suffering is a key element of the fruit of the Spirit. That is, it's Spirit-generated number four in the list of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Long-suffering is how we are to deal with other believers. Long-suffering can only be generated supernaturally in the life of the believer. Long-suffering is not connected to pride, but to humility, meekness, and kindness. The believer who understands his own sin realizes how God has been long-suffering with him. Long-suffering is necessary for those who would disciple others in the Christian life because those of you who have been parents know how long-suffering you have to be with your babies. They spit up and they mess their pants and they do all kinds of things and you don't just scream and yell at them and say, why don't you grow up? You're long-suffering with them because you are discipling them. You are training them to be mature adults. And that's what those who are in spiritual positions of leadership, those who have grown spiritually must do with those who are infants in Christ. Long suffering is necessary for those who would disciple others in the Christian life. Long suffering is essential in proclaiming the Word of God at all times. As we noted at the beginning, the long suffering of God reaches an end when God's plan for His people is finally finished at any given divine juncture in history. Folks, if you refuse to grow, if any of us refuse to grow, finally God's long-suffering will come to an end. And he will chasten. He guarantees it in his word. And if there is a continually rebellious attitude and stiffness of the neck, hardening of the heart, God judges. There's one final point of long-suffering that we talked about, though, before the judgment of God comes. And that was in 2 Peter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of all should come to repentance, and account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. God is still putting up with us because there are still those of his elect who have not yet trusted Christ. That's part of our job is to reach them. We don't know who they are, so we preach the gospel indiscriminately to all. But there's coming a day when the last man, woman, boy, or girl will trust Christ 
and the rapture will take place and God's long suffering with the wickedness of this world will come to an end and we enter the periods of judgment in the book of Revelation. So that brings us tonight. Where to look for converts or the bottom of the barrel, Acts 8, verses 8 through 11. Verse 8, And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Remember, this is after he's moved next door. He moved next door in verse 7. He moved to the, to the home of justice, which was joined hard to the synagogue. That means there was a single common wall that separated them. They didn't have great big yards back then like we have now. Uh, there was a single wall that separated them. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. For I have much people in this city. It's a magnificent statement about the elective purposes of God. God looked down from heaven and he saw Corinth. And he not only saw its wickedness, and it was a wicked city, we'll talk about that in a minute, but God saw those whom he called, I have much people. Those are my people down there. Paul, I've put you there for a purpose. I'm going to lead you to the people that need to know Christ. And when you preach the gospel to them, they are going to respond. Others may not. You just preached in the synagogue where they've been listening to the Bible for years and years and years and years and years. Where they've got rabbis and teachers who have been trained in scripture. Where they know all kinds of technical things about the Hebrew Old Testament text. And I'm going to send you to some people who know nothing. Who don't know Genesis 1 from John 3.16. I'm going to send you to them. And they're my people. I have much people in this vile city of Corinth. And you're the man I'm going to put there for them. Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee. And no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. He was there for 18 months. He was there for a year and a half. He'd been run from pillar to post in his missionary journeys up to this point. He'd hardly had any time to stop and eat lunch. But God said, at this place, I have a lot of people and I'm going to use you to reach them. Powerful statement. Now remember where all this is going on. This is going on in Corinth, which was perhaps the most perverted sex capital of the Greek-speaking world. Corinth was located on the Isthmus of Corinth, where ships not only landed, but where most of the ships traveling west were dragged overland from the Aegean Sea, which is on the east side of the Isthmus, over to the Gulf of Corinth, which is on the west side, which emptied into the Ionian Sea, the southern part of the Adriatic Sea. For those of you who may not know, and certainly I think we have some folks in the audience who probably don't know because we have young people watching this, who don't know what an isthmus is, imagine two very large bodies of land that are separated by a very narrow piece of water, but across that very narrow piece of water there is a strip of land that joins those two large bodies of land. And that's what an isthmus is, that narrow strip of land that connects the two large bodies of land. Now, both of these two bodies of land that are joined together are part of Greece. Corinth is located in Greece, and so is everything south of it, and so is everything north of it for hundreds of miles. Both of them are part of Greece. The upper land mass, which is part of the main continent, is the province of Macedonia. You've heard lots about Macedonia as we've been reading through this. And Paul has traveled all over Macedonia, and he's come down into Macedonia from what we call today Turkey. He's traveled on the land for most of his missionary journeys. He's had some sea journeys, but traveled across the land. So he's down in Greece at this point. The lower, smaller body of land is part of the province of Achaia. That lower body of land is also called by its descriptive name, the Peloponnesus, the Peloponnesus. Now, Corinth is located about 40 miles west of Athens across the water, or if you go up around the top of that little bay there, 
uh, it's a little bit longer than 40 miles, but if you travel directly from Athens to Corinth, that's about 40 miles by water. Ships traveling east made the journey in reverse. By the way, if you have a map in the back of your Bible, you, I'm going to be describing some stuff because it's very important to how the gospel spread in this area and then how it spread around the world. So if you've got a map in the back, you can flip to the back of your Bible and look at the map there of Paul's missionary journeys and you'll see where Corinth is located and you'll see that lower part, which is Achaia, and then the upper part, which is Macedonia. And you'll see that little tiny narrow isthmus is over on the eastern side. And then to the left of it, there's a very narrow of body of water that goes out into the Ionian Sea, which is just south of the Adriatic Sea. And if you go all the way across that body of water, you will end up coming to uh, Italy, where Rome is located. That was a very key, important area. Uh, and why they dragged the ships across, we'll talk in just a second, across that piece of land, instead of trying to sail all the way around the end of Achaia. But anyway, so ships traveling east made the journey in reverse. The Isthmus had two separate seaports, one which was on the east side and one which was on the west side. One of them was Sencrea. Now, if you've ever read your New Testament, you have read about Sencrea. Sencrea is mentioned in the New Testament. It was on the Aegean Sea as a suburb of Corinth. And then Lycaeum was on the edge of the Gulf of Corinth on the west. That is over on the left side as you're looking down at your map. The Romans destroyed Corinth in 146 BC, but because of its location, it was so important, they later rebuilt it under Julius Caesar, I know you've heard of him, in 46 BC. By the time Paul arrived in the city and had spent 18 months, and this is nearly, it was a little more than 100 years later after Julius Caesar rebuilt it, Paul visits Corinth in between 50 and 52 BC, he's there for 18 months during that period of time. The city had grown to a population of 500,000, half a million people, which is a very large city for the ancient world. Corinth was the ideal crossroads. Ah, a key city in God's plan. Corinth was the ideal crossroads. In fact, the only crossroads by land from north to south because of that little narrow strip of land. People coming from the north and wanting getting down into Achaia without going to sea had to come through Corinth north and south. And it was the very best east-west crossroad for ships coming by sea. That made it a notoriously wealthy commercial city, a cosmopolitan city. And due to the nature of the sailors that is still notorious today, it was a city that was known for its immorality. And so it became a wealthy resort city of sorts, similar to what we would say Las Vegas where people who had money to spend on their own pleasures and their own entertainment went to indulge the flesh. As a result, Corinth was a city that worshipped sex and pleasure. And the goddess of the city was Aphrodite, the goddess of erotic love. Her temple was built on the highest point of the city and was filled with hundreds of religious prostitutes who served the desires of her devotees. Those women also had um, part-time jobs, night jobs. They entertained legally in the nightlife of the city. The city also idolized sports, interesting, sex and sports, and had hundreds of athletic contests in their stadium, which was second only to the stadium of the Olympics on Mount Olympus, where the Greek Olympics were held. At Corinth, the major competition, which drew crowds from all over the ancient world, were held every two years. Because of its focus on sex and sports, it never became an intellectual center like Athens. So, you know, if you think about it, Corinth is very much like the United States has become today. Sex, sports, the rejection of true knowledge and science and the rush for greedy lust and pleasure, where nobody wants to think about God the Creator to whom we must all someday give an account. When Paul was preaching in Athens, you recall, he was at an intellectual center and he was dealing with intellectuals and he started with the gospel of creation. At Corinth, he goes back to the synagogue. He's working with people who already have that as a foundation, who already understand Genesis chapter 1. He doesn't have to keep laying the foundation there. They already know that. But now he's come to a city where the majority of the city are focused on two things, sex and sports. Now, let's answer the question, why did they drag the boats overland at this point? The overland portage accomplished at least six different things. Number one, 
And imagine that, all doing this by hand. Animals and people dragging big ships. We know that the ship Paul was on uh, carried over 270 people, the one that wrecked. Uh, and, you know, the soldiers were on it, and Paul was on it, and the sailors were on it, and passengers were on it, and they had to throw everything overboard. We'll get to that later when we get to the end of the book of Acts. But, I mean, that's a big ship that can carry that many people. These weren't rowboats that they were pulling across the isthmus. But by doing that, number one, it shortened the time by several days around the southern end of Achaia. Number two, it shortened the travel distance by about 120 miles. Number three, it meant that the ships did not have to sail through the more dangerous waters of the Mediterranean Sea, and they were able to avoid part of the dangerous waters of the Cleides. Number three, and this was quite important, especially as Corinth was developing, it avoided Sparta at the tip of the Peloponnesus and the sea lanes which ran between Sparta and Athens. Remember we said Athens was 40 miles to the west of Corinth if you came straight across the water and came through the Pleiades area and came over to Corinth. And so it avoided those sea lanes which in times of war could be dangerous. And I suspect that, I hope anyway, that most of you have heard about the Peloponnesian War between Sparta and Athens. That was a very dangerous area to travel if you were going to go by sea. And so Corinth was north of where Sparta was located. Athens is over here. So if you were coming into port, you would come into Corinth and you wouldn't have to go down to that area which there were ships going back between Sparta and Athens which were at war with each other. That war lasted for 27 years, from 431 to 404 BC. It was the result of a flagrant breaking of what was called the 30 Years Treaty. That war is recorded by the most penetrating and important historian of military and political history in antiquity. The man who recorded it, the Syedes, was actually a military man. He was a general. He was actually a combatant in that particular war. But because he was later exiled in 424 BC, he had access to both sides. He's written perhaps what is the most balanced history of that period of time. I encourage you to read up on that war if you don't know anything about it. It's decisive in the way that the ancient Greek culture prepared the way for Rome. And because that war helped prepare the culture, it also helped ultimately spread the gospel in the plan of God. I think that clearly God is in control of history hundreds of years in advance before Paul reaches Corinth to make sure that everything is prepared and ready for that outreach. The fifth reason they dragged the boats overland from Corinth was it was a more direct route to and from Rome and then to and from the east than taking the land route. Because if you started at Rome, you'd have to go all the way north, cut all the way across the top of the Adriatic Sea, and then come all the way back down before you could go east. This was a direct route straight across. And number six, on the west side of the Isthmus of Corinth was a narrow neck of water that was protected on both sides, that's the Gulf of Corinth, by land for more than 100 miles, which gave more shelter from the storms than sailing out in the open sea around the end of that peninsula of Greece. So as you see, I hope, Corinth was in a key position for the distribution of the gospel. The very first thing that we notice is that God gave Paul some very key morally upright and pure leadership for this new church. Now, you know, folks, that's a big deal when you're in a city like Corinth. But when Paul left that synagogue and went next door, verse 7, verse 8, it tells us, who his first converts were. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue. He was a man who was serious about God. He was a man who was serious about the word of God. He was a man who had risen to a position of leadership in a group of people that held strictly to the law, who didn't go along with the city around them. You know, thou shalt not do this and thou shalt not do that. Not, I mean, if he had been involved in fornication or in adultery or in some other kind of sin that's listed in the Ten Commandments, he would not have been a ruler in the synagogue at Corinth. They knew what the city was like. They didn't want that kind of people. They wanted morally pure people in positions of leadership. He was an upright man. 
Paul was a church planting missionary. Paul needed some morally pure, well-grounded men to fill positions of leadership when God called him to move on. As we see from the first epistle to the Corinthians, the kind of people that got saved at Corinth, almost all of them had a very sordid and dirty background and certainly were still practicing ugly and nasty things when they got saved. So God in his mercy had the very most important key Jewish leader in the synagogue be the principal convert to Paul's message. Even when the rest of the synagogue reached the tipping point and emphatically rejected the gospel. And we talked about that, of course, last week. A tipping point of even one person can result in damnation for an entire family, church, city, or nation. And the carrying of the gospel else can res elsewhere. The Corinthian synagogue didn't realize it, but that it was at that point that the gospel would go principally to the Gentiles and they would be left groveling in the dust in their self-righteous wealth. It was a wealthy city. The Jews have always been successful in terms of financial things, and they were there at Corinth as well. When Timotheus and Silas were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. Notice something else. As we look at this passage here and as we read about Crispus, it tells us something interesting about him. God is beginning to fulfill his promise that he gave back in Acts chapter 16, verse 31. You recall Acts 16. Acts 16 is where Paul was thrown into prison and um, with Silas. And they are in the middle of the prison. They're busy singing after they've been beaten. Everybody's been listening to them. Everybody in the prison heard them. Upstairs, people were listening to them. People were hearing them. An earthquake happens. All the doors are open. Everybody's chains get thrown off. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, verse 27, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for light and sprang in and came, trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas. That's not typical of a Roman jailer to kneel in front of his prisoners and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now the promise. In fact, this promise is going to be mentioned four times in the next four verses. Four times. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Don't stop the verse there. Many times when I go to various churches and they quote that verse, they stop at that point. There are three more words in that verse. And thy house. Verse 32, And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. The Father is the gatekeeper for the house. The Father is the one who, if things are functioning the way that they should be functioning, is the one who opens and closes the door to his house. He came in and preached the gospel not just to the jailer, but to his house. Verse 33, And he took them, he took them, that is the jailer, took Paul and Silas, the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his straightway. We've just been talking about his household, haven't we? And then the fourth occurrence, verse 34, And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, here's the phrase again, believing in God with all his house. God promised it back there in 1 Corinthians 16, there in verse 31. We see it is working out in effectuality as we get to Acts chapter 18, as we look at Crispus, where Crispus believes in all his house. Four times in that passage in Acts 16, it emphasizes the salvation of his entire family. Now, in the past, I've done several extended messages on that subject, so I won't repeat them all here. But remember, when we were earlier in the book of Acts, we contrasted the way that God worked in the Old Testament and the way that he begins to work after Pentecost. In the Old Testament, we find a repeated narrowing of those whom God saves and blesses. Adam and Eve had multiple children, not just Cain and Abel and Seth. It says they had many children after that, which is where Cain got his wife. But God selected the line of Seth. People rapidly multiplied and filled the earth with wickedness and violence, so God narrowed the line again with Noah and his family. 
After the flood, people multiplied again and built the Tower of Babel in the days of Nimrod. So God narrowed the line again to the line of Shem. They continued in wickedness, so God narrowed the line again to Abraham, then Isaac over Ishmael, then of the twelve tribes to Judah, and then of all those descendants from Judah, then to David, and then to his son Nathan, not to Solomon, and we've talked about how God chooses people that we might not have chosen, and then to Boaz and Ruth, and he kept narrowing it down until he reached Mary, the mother of Jesus. But after Pentecost, the message of salvation is beginning to expand. It was being narrowed and narrowed and narrowed to get down to Jesus. But now it begins to expand as we reach the book of Acts. We find the Jewish men in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. We get to Acts chapter 8 and we find somebody who is half Jewish and half Gentile, the Samaritans. And then we get to Acts chapter 10 we find somebody who's born a Gentile and converted to Judaism, the Ethiopian eunuch. Then we find those who are 100% Gentile, the Roman centurion, and all those of his household. And we see the gospel spreading and growing and reaching. As Jesus said, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. It's no longer being narrowed down. It's being expanded and spread as we move through the book of Acts. Now the promise is, as Peter put it, Acts 2.39, for the promise is unto you, and to your children and to all that are far off. And here's the caveat. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Election is still at work. But God is expanding, 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 expanding as we move through this dispensation of grace. It's of great interest to note that this specific promise is made to the Corinthians. Did you know this gets repeated to the Corinthians? I think that was very important because at Corinth they were having a lot of problems, a lot of sex problems, a lot of marriage problems. First Corinthians chapter 7, the whole chapter is dedicated to that subject. But that promise concerning your families is made to the very church where Paul is preaching in our text tonight. They had lots of marriage problems at Corinth, including mixed marriages between believers and unbelievers. First Corinthians chapter 7 deals with a whole list of those problems. Listen to what it says in verses 13 and 14. And let the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, here's a mixed marriage, a saved wife and an unsaved husband. Let the woman that hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. Some very important teachings about divorce and remarriage in the New Testament. Marriage is for life, folks. Divorce is not an option. At Corinth, they're excoriated because they are involved in doing it even though there might be great cause for doing it, especially at Corinth. And he tells you the reason why in verse 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. It works both ways. It doesn't matter whether the husband is a, is a pagan or the wife is a pagan. If one partner in that marriage is saved, whether it's man or woman, there's an important reason to hold the marriage together. And it's given in the last phrase. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. The word translated holy is hagioi. That's the word that every place else in the New Testament is translated saints. Paul tells the Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2.13, But we are bound to give thanks to God for you always, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath, from the beginning, chosen you unto salvation. There's election. Through sanctification. That's the second step. And the third step, and belief of the truth. Sanctification relates to being set apart. That's what the word saints means those who have been set apart by God. And God sets us apart even prior to our salvation. We're not saved yet. We're not on our way to heaven yet in terms of practical transformation of the life from death to life. But when God chooses, he sets us apart so that we can't die until the moment that he regenerates us by his spirit. And Paul says, even if only one member of the couple is a believer, God has special promises for your children. That's what we saw taking place in reality in Acts chapter 18 
where it says not only Crispus, but his whole house believed. What was promised back in Acts chapter 16 to the Corinthian, uh, to the uh, Philippian jailer. What was promised by Peter in Acts chapter 2 as we move through the day of Pentecost and into this new period of expansion of the gospel. What incredible promises those are. That, folks, is also one of the reasons why moral purity is so important. Because you see, it affects both you and your children. I can't emphasize that point strongly enough, especially for any young people who happen to be watching this broadcast. Remember, the church at Corinth is the church where Paul was in our text tonight, where these exhortations are being made, and there's a lot of immorality in the church today. Keep yourself pure. Keep yourself pure. Paul says so in 1 Corinthians 6.15. Here it is again to the church at Corinth where Paul is in our text tonight. Here's what he's preaching. Verse 15 of chapter 6. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. Now, listen, folks. This wasn't like they're out on some desert island and there, there were no official prostitute places. I mean, Corinth was the prostitute capital of the world. That was the focus of their idolatry of Aphrodite. That was the nightlife of the city. He had to warn the church. Don't you know that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? They were surrounded by harlots. A man couldn't walk to church without being accosted by harlots, prostitutes. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two saith he shall be one flesh. Now, folks, that goes back to Genesis 2.28. That's where God established marriage between Adam and Eve. That's what makes the bond. It's not the maximum marriage, but it's the minimum that's necessary for a marriage bond to be formed. That's why moral purity is so essential. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two saith he shall be one flesh. He quotes Genesis where God established marriage. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? which you have of God. You are not your own. You can't use God's property that way. For you are bought with a price. God paid a lot for you. God paid an infinite sacrifice for you. The death of his own son. You belong to him. How dare you use your body for moral impurity? That includes your eyes, what you look at. If you look at pornography, you're guilty of fornication. Folks, this is serious business. This is what's going on at Corinth, the city where Paul is preaching. And God saved people out of that mess. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. So many of us think, well, we just glorify him spiritually, but it doesn't matter what we do. Your body is bought with a price. The blood of Christ. Or as Peter calls it, the precious blood of Christ. Fornication includes not only what we call premarital sex, but it also includes all the other forms of perversion that were prevalent at Corinth and that have become prevalent and are about to become dominant and legally approved and possibly legally mandated for continued government recognition. And they may also curtail the religious freedom and status of the church and other Christian organizations here in the United States. I know I'm being blunt, but not only was Corinth like the United States, Corinth was in the church. That's why this message is entitled, Where to Look for Converts, or The Bottom of the Barrel. We need to realize 
that Christ came into the world to save sinners. We keep looking for nice, upper-class, middle-class American families with lots of discretionary money that they will be easily cajoled into giving to the church. Perhaps we need to take a clue from Jesus and go, quote, into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. You know, I know that makes for a very messy church like Corinth. But if you have qualified leaders like Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and his family, there is hope even for such a church. You need a foundation of qualified, fully committed leaders and their families, especially for such a church. But remember, Christ came into the world to save sinners. We're in the rescue business, not the resort business. That's why we keep putting on the prayer sheet that God will raise up more qualified leaders for this church. Do you pray that every day? I do. You know what the qualifications are. First Timothy chapter 3, Titus chapter 1. I've preached through both of those passages. We've talked about every one of those qualifications. All the qualifications for deacons, all the qualifications for elders, all the qualifications for those who would become pastors called bishops in the New Testament. Do you pray every day that God will begin to raise up some men like that with qualified families? Because you can't reach the unwashed masses, if you will, unless there's somebody who can be there like that for them. Paul was about to move on. He was there for a good period of time, but he had to have somebody he could leave behind who could handle that kind of a situation. And so his very first convert is Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue. For 18 months, Paul was in Corinth leading people to Christ who are really the bottom of the barrel type of people. Remember, he had been meeting in the home of Justice whose house joined heart under the synagogue. That's probably the reason for why we see what happens in the next few verses. We'll talk about that next week. That's probably the chief reason that the Jews raised a riot and dragged Paul to the legal authorities in those following verses. Because not only did they hate the singing and preaching coming through the wall next door, they hated the non-middle-class riffraff that kept showing up next door with all their horrendous problems that Paul categorizes. He categorizes all those problems in 1 Corinthians. After seeing that God gave Paul a qualified, committed leader and his family in verse 8, the next thing we learn in our text is that God guaranteed protection and success. Look at verse 9. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. Now, if you've been with us on Sunday evenings, you've seen in the past that Paul had been beaten up pretty badly and stoned in other cities where he had been doing his missionary work. This is a very special vision that tells us something about Paul, the real human being. God had given him a vision not to be afraid. After all, Paul was in a city similar to Las Vegas, and it probably had a system of organized crime, like Las Vegas does, and other nasty elements that could have been accessed by the Jews if they wanted to do Paul in. They hired all kinds of rotten people in other places, and certainly they would have had access to rotten people there in Corinth as well. Paul could have been afraid that the people who had been following him from city to city would also find him at Corinth and raise a riot. I suspect that at times Paul felt discouraged in his spirit. Paul felt weary in his labors, and he says so on occasion in 1 Corinthians, for example. Even though he knew that you have to keep running the race, and he says that also in 1 Corinthians. It's a church that could have given a pastor a lot of headaches, you know. You know, I've often felt that way, too. Sometimes I weary of trying to drag people behind me, kicking and screaming and resisting and refusing to do right, and show some genuine commitment to Christ. I also get tired of just dragging those who simply smile and do nothing, but just be a little bit nice. As I've often said to Judy over the many years of ministry in the past, 
you know, I used to confide to her a lot of things that I don't tell everybody else. One of the things I used to say to her is, you know, I feel like I'm climbing the sheer face of a cliff in a blinding storm while wild birds of prey keep clawing and ripping my head with their talons and beaks. But it's not just me climbing, I'm climbing with a rope over my shoulder back to a gigantic basket that I'm hauling up the cliff that is full of people sheltered from the rain and busy, busy with a picnic and arguing over petty idiotic trivia and hollering for me to climb faster so they can get to the top and see the view. Often I feel like that in the church. It's not easy, folks, when you're alone. You know, I can understand why Paul got that vision from God and that God gave it to him for an encouragement here. Be not afraid, but speak. Hold not thy peace, for I am with thee. You know, we read those same type of words years later in Paul's epistle to the Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Let your conversation be without covetousness, being content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Just like he said at Corinth, for I am with thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. God had told Paul, be not afraid, for I have much people here in this city. Nobody's going to hurt you. That's precisely the same two ideas that Paul writes when he writes the epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 13, verses 6 and 7. Notice something else. That statement there in Hebrews, verses 5 and 6, is in the immediate context of verse 4. Verse 4 is what precedes verses 5 and 6. I know you can count. Verse 4 deals with one of the principal problems at Corinth which was sexual immorality. Sexual immorality is a major attack against every church, so remember that judgment is coming. We've talked about in our series on the Ten Plagues in Egypt in the morning worship services. Listen to verse 4. This is what precedes that business about I will never leave you nor forsake her, sake you, don't fear what men can do unto you. Verse 4 says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God, will judge. That's serious business, folks. That's serious business. The second thing that we notice here in Acts chapter 18 in these two verses is where God chooses his elect. That's in verse 10. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. For I have much people in this city. Not in Athens, there was a few that had believed in Athens, but in Corinth, there were much people. God chooses the people that we wouldn't give a second thought to. Listen to what he writes over in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14. Here they've been fighting over another carnal issue, which you see in a lot of Baptist churches and some, quote, Reformed churches today, too is how are we going to baptize them? When are we going to baptize them? When they're little or when they're big? When they make a profession of faith or when they're part of a, a Christian family? When they're members of a church family that's actually members of the church? You know, that kind of argument. Shall we do it by immersion? Shall we do it by sprinkling? Shall we do it by pouring? Let's fight about it. That was the first fight that Paul dealt with at Corinth. First Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, Paul gives commendation to the church at Corinth. You get to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, and everything from there to the last verse of the epistle deals with problems at Corinth and how they need to get their act together. Nine verses of commendation, the rest of the book, dealing with problems at Corinth. But listen to verse 14 of chapter 1. They've been fighting about baptism. Paul writes and he says, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. Now, we know that Paul baptized some others. He talks about the household of Stephanus and so on like that uh, a little bit later in that passage. But then he says, besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. <laughs> now, we know that he baptized a lot of people because it says so in Acts. But Paul didn't keep baptismal records. This week, I had a lady call me who wants to get married someplace else, who went to faith Christian school, and who was baptized here in this church years ago and she needs her baptismal records 
to prove that she was baptized, so I suspect she's baptizing someone who's not a Protestant. Or marrying, not baptizing, marrying someone who's not a Protestant. Paul didn't keep any baptismal records. We learn that here when he writes back to the Corinthians. I have no idea where those baptismal records are. I hope I can find them for her, but I don't know where they are. That wasn't a big deal as far as Paul was concerned. I baptized none of you but Gaius and Crispus. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Interesting. A different commission that God gave to Paul than he gave to the other apostles. Different than what Jesus said to the apostles at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. I've talked about that, so I won't go on with it. But notice here, I baptized none of you but Crispus or Gaius. Crispus was the chief Jew. We've already seen that. But we learn later in the book of Romans that Gaius was the chief Gentile. Jews and Gentiles were in the same church. Later, the church moved from the house of justice. They moved to the house of Gaius. We discover that in Romans chapter 16, verse 23. And we discover that several other important Corinthians were saved. Listen to Romans chapter 16, verse 23. Gaius, mine host, and of the whole church, saluteth you. Erastus, the chamberlain of the city, saluteth you. And Cortus, a brother, the chamberlain is the city treasurer. God did save a few who were important people in that city. Then Paul goes on, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. That's verse 24. Then verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. And we've discussed what a mystery is in Ephesians chapter 3, which gives the definition. But now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of the faith. So here he's talking about that spread of the gospel. We got the Jews, we got the Gentiles, we got those who have a foundation, those who don't have a foundation. But it's reaching out to all nations for the obedience of the faith. Now, last verse. The God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. And then there's a postscript at the end of that text, which says, written to the Romans from Corinthus. Romans is written from Corinth. That's the city where we are tonight. And sent by Phoebe, servant of the church at Sencrea. Remember Sencrea? One of the actual ports where Corinth was located in the middle between the two of them. There was a woman by the name of Phoebe who got saved at Sencrea. And she became a messenger for Paul. Now back to our text there in 1 Corinthians. Lest any should say that I have baptized in mine own name, and I baptized also the household of Stephanus, besides they know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. In other words, you don't throw in stuff and fight about it that's going to stand in the way of the proclamation of the gospel. All the petty stuff that we all argue about all the time. And then he goes on and talks about the foolishness of the preaching of the cross, how he preaches only Christ crucified, under the Jews a stumbling block, under the Greeks foolishness. So we got both groups there. He's been reaching both of them. And he gets a different response from each one of them. To the Jews, it's a stumbling block. To the Greeks, that's nonsense. We don't care about that business of some Jew dying on a cross in Jerusalem. Are you kidding me? You know, that business of the resurrection. I mean, hey, after all, when you're dead, you're dead. I mean, it was foolishness as far as the Greek culture was concerned. But we get down to verses 25 and 26. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, the weakness of God is stronger than men. And then here it ties us back to what's going on in our text tonight. Why, the message is entitled, Where to Look for Converts, or The Bottom of the Barrel. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, he'd just been in Athens, not many mighty, they knew about Sparta to the south of them. Not many noble are called. And I can tell you, I am very thankful that he said not any. He just said not many. Because we see that Gaius was saved. We see that the chamberlain of the city got saved, Erastus. But God hath chosen, do you want to know why you got saved? Here it is in verse 27. This is why I know I got saved. God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. 
And the base things of the world, if you wanted scum off the bottom of the barrel, you went to Corinth. Paul's writing this to the Corinthians. He's telling them, folks, that's where you came from. The base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and the things which are not to bring to naught things that are. And here's the reason. Why does God do that? You know, he doesn't want anybody to stand up in heaven saying, hey, I was rich, I bought my way to heaven. Or I was powerful and I fought my way to heaven. Or I was important, I was noble, and so God had to let me in. Verse 29 tells you why God did it, why he didn't choose very many of those, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Hmm. God wants all the glory for himself. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, they're the wise things of the world, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That's what makes you noble. That's what makes you powerful. Is when you're in Christ. Because all those qualities belong to him. You know, we don't have time tonight to catalog all the sins at Corinth. But perhaps that will help you see in Paul's own words why the message tonight was entitled, Where to Look for Converts or The Bottom of the Barrel. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for this portion of your word and for its power. It reminds us really of who we are. And we ought not to get up on our high horse and start squawking about how great we are. It's all of you. It's all of grace. And you reached down and pulled us out of the miry clay and set our feet upon a rock and put a new song in our mouth. Father, we thank you for your word, for how it ties together, for the historical context into which you put it, the location at the crossroads of the world, so that many men and women might be saved, and that in a worst possible city, an immoral, wicked city, you said, I have much people here. Help us to that, to remember that as we are here in the midst of a very wicked city. In the area of very wicked cities, a very wicked portion of the country, or just a couple hours drive south of us, we have some wicked leadership in every branch of government, in all the regulatory agencies. In even a place like that, you have much people. We pray, Father, that you will lead your servants to reach them for Christ. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight.